Welcome to episode 57 of the Hellbound Podcast. Podcast, podcast, podcast. I'm Michael Chan. Yes, I am back. Your Mr. Star Trek Discovery is right here today. I don't know where I've been for the last few weeks. Uh, my doppelgangers kidnapped me and locked me in a dark, dark place. But I broke out and smashed my way back to... Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'm back with my family. You can hear my son going, eh, right? Yes, he is. And uh, I am here. I am finally here again. And who are you? Who's my lovely co-host here? Me. <laughs> yeah, you. Uh, I'm Alex Blackburn, the founder of the Hellbound Horror Festival and co-host of the Hellbound Podcast with Michael. Are you sure you're the real Alex Blackburn? Uh, I don't feel like it. I feel like um, like I don't know. I feel like I'm outside my own body because I'm not very well at the moment. So yeah. See, I see because my doppelgangers warned me about your doppelgangers. So. Yeah. They can't be more than Oh. Oh, why is there a third voice? Why is there a third voice? Oh my! Who is this? Disembodied voice of podcast that came before this one. Ah. Oh. That's that, that. That's my wife. She's my wife. This is Jessica Chan. She, she she's going to be co-host today. Wow. So, Michael, I wanted to talk to you about a specific film. If that's yes. where you want, if that's where you'd like to start, um, I would love to. Which one would you like to talk about today? <clears throat> well, um, there's two, but I think we'll hold off on Barbarian until you've both seen it. Oh, no. seen... oh, we've all seen it. We've all seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll um, talk about Smile, um, and then possibly Barbarian, depending on um, how long we're running for. But so, why did you want to talk about Smile in particular, Michael? Have you seen it? Have you I've seen, seen it? it. Yeah, we've seen it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read the description of this film first. Okay. After witnessing a bizarre traumatic incident involving a patient, Doctor Rose Cotter starts experiencing frightening occurrences that she can't explain. As an overwhelming terror begins taking over her life, Rose must confront her troubling past in order to survive and escape her horrifying new reality. I'm going to warn everybody today. I'm going to I'm I'm actually going to spoil stuff and here's the reason why. Normally I don't like spoiling movies, especially because I I normally want people to watch a movie for themselves. But I'm going to start off by saying this movie is so crap. <laughs> um, let, let me let me let me clarify that it's so crap that I don't think anyone should watch it. Now, before I move on, I must say that for most of the film, it's actually not crap. I if this film had stuck its landing, I would have given it a nine out of ten. But it chose in the last five minutes to completely derail everything it worked towards and has an ending that is so bad that it is not worth giving uh, this movie time. It's not worth giving this movie money. It's so disrespectful to women, especially, that I think that I am shocked at the misogyny inherent in that ending. I'm so shocked that this movie was able to A, be made nowadays, and B, actually get a good critical review at all after that ending that, yeah, I'm, I'm just shocked. I just I just don't think anyone should be supporting this film after that ending. Okay. Sorry, I'll like ask. So, I'm the guest star. I'll wait till that. So, so the film is basically about a woman seeing someone kill themselves. And, and and this person had been describing seeing a, a being, seeing something that's essentially smiling, but this being takes the form like a shapeshifter of people in their life, right? And 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 this this person who, who kills himself had also seen someone kill themselves. No, it died in front of them. Her grandfather died in front of them when they were. Before they killed no, the professor killed himself. The original person that she meets, the woman, the says he, she killed... takes many forms, uh, including the grandfather who I saw die in front of me when I was seven. Are so we she's talking seen about two the... people 
She's seen two people die. That is fair. She has seen two people die. No, but I'm saying, I'm not even talking about, now you're going further into the film. I'm talking about the inciting incident right at the beginning. The story says that she saw someone die. Not not the grandfather, but the professor who, who knocked himself. Oh, you're going later. No, she you're going later. Right, right away. So she does later not. She that she saw someone kill himself. Oh, they talk. See, now La we're even. Ladies, ladies. Doesn't and matter. I don't see, give a crap. The whole that, thing, the reason the how the thing got the transferred to the how the actual being got transferred to her was from when she saw a professor kill himself with a hammer, which is described by the police right at the beginning of the film, along with. The other doctor saying that she saw a professor kill himself. Nothing to do with the grandfather, which was uh, actually came after the professor hitting himself with a hammer. Yeah, but she but mentions it in her initial interview. It's one of the first things. There's she does. multiple things that happen. Okay. Anyway. Okay. But when they brought her <laughs> in and I'm said that she right. should. <clears throat> She had young trauma, childhood trauma. Everybody. So I was getting to that okay. later in this episode. Oh, this is why it's difficult. We're keeping all this in, everyone. This is also how I know she's a doppelganger now, I and I came home <laughs> because, because because somebody would have liked it. No, you do not. No, you. Uh... You're like, Stop talking. I didn't say you want to stop talking. Why don't you then describe the film to the audience? <laughs> no, you go. See, this is the episode where you see a, 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 a married couple argue like a married couple. <laughs> the real horror show. Yeah. This well, is you our... know, you know, when I've been recording the last uh, few weeks of uh, dissecting Dharma with Vic, they, they, all of this chatter gets cut out, but this is being kept in. <laughs> <laughs> Thankful. Okay, Thank so so Thanks, describe the being since clearly I'm not I'm not describing it right. I, I got confused with what you said, and then I was trying to explain something. And I'm just saying you were talking about something. Anyways, there's two factors to this thing. One, everybody who mentions it experienced some kind of grief or trauma earlier in their life. Yes. And two, it was only passed on from one person commit suicide in front of the other, and that's how it gets you. Right. But they make a point of mentioning. Like very casually in conversation, whenever she's investigating this, that she's like, "Oh, he lost his brother and he never recovered." They oh, always, I saw my yeah. grandfather die in front of him when I was seven. So they always make a point to mention, whenever not just that they saw someone recently kill themselves in front of them, but they had some kind of childhood trauma that uh, they were affected by. Well, Doctor Potter starts experiencing exactly what her patient experiences. So she starts seeing the being and start seeing people in her life who are smiling and essentially saying that she's going to die. Yeah. Uh, and so obviously the rest of the film is trying to figure out what this thing is and how to end its, uh, it's being passed on. And for, for, for the entirety of the film up leading up to the last five minutes, meaning leading up to the ending, it is so good. Like it is, it's it's good drama. It's good acting. Uh, there's even good jump scares. There's there's a lot in this film. The visuals are like really they stick with you. They're very disturbing. Yeah, everything's very disturbing. It's it's really good horror. And 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 it, what what like this film talks about the subject matter it it uh, to deal with. Is is mental illness trauma, but also there's uh, there's a sense of like you know like women are always telling come on smile 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 right so it's it's tackling mental illness and misogyny in our society, and once we get to the end, the expectation of something happens when you choose as a filmmaker to deal with mental illness especially, and how to overcome societal expectations of women that are that are not uh, appropriate. You would expect that the message should be it is able to be overcome. Right? Yeah. Right? Well, they chose in the last five minutes to throw away any possibility of a, a, a good, proper message in favor of basically having our hero lose 
and uh, setting up a sequel if one is ever made. I was going to say, you forgot to mention that they make it a point of her avoiding dealing with the trauma of seeing her mother die. Thank you. You're right. Throughout the film. Yes. So the implication being like, this is what the monster's feeding of because it's unresolved trauma that she has about her mother's death, which we eventually go to find out is because her mother asked for her help because she OD'd. Yeah. Uh, accidentally because she's a drug addict. And then she was so scared of this woman because she traumatized, like she obviously was abusive, abusive yeah. that she didn't call for help and her mother died, which she's carried around. And eventually she faces the the monster, the demon that takes the form of her mother. And she's like, I was a child and I'm terrified, but it's not my fault and I'm done feeling guilty about it. So it's like, oh, look, she finally like stood up to this thing and she set it on fire and she's like, F you. You know, I'm going to confront this trauma head on. And then they're like, sorry, you can't overcome trauma. She died. No, but on top of all of that, one of the things is when you're dealing with trauma you're, and, and mental illness and and, and, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and and stuff like this, you can't go at it alone. You need to seek help. And that was another thing. She kept trying, essentially. She, she pushed everyone away, which yeah. is fine, except she's a psychiatrist. So Right, but, but at, right at the end of the movie, she seeks help. She actually oh, what you think she seeks help, but it's actually the demon. Yeah, it's the demon her. something with her. So by the end of this film, in the last five minutes, the message it said was, uh, mental trauma can never be overcome. Don't bother. Don't bother, just kill yourself. Yeah, that's what it used to. And also, misogyny is never going to go away. You're effed. Well, I don't know was a misogyny thing it's more like people are like oh you're not depressed just smile more you, uh, just, you know just put a happy it was face a new, on for me, happy thoughts. i've been thinking a lot about it and i do agree that there is that that aspect of the mental of mental illness it was dealing with yeah but i thought it was interesting that they chose uh the female perspective to go at it from it because like just half men half women when they the chain oh, the so chain was, is definitely yeah. uh, the monster is definitely going after men oh, and women. I just felt that it was interesting to come at it uh, from a woman's perspective because it is something that women are told to do all the time. Like, come on, smile. On top of the mental illness, just, just you know, things will be okay. Just smile. So it's Can a I, lot of that. Also, like a really, really dark thing is that she passes it on the end to her friend, her boyfriend, her ex, who's a white cop. Yeah. And we find out later, like, the only way to get rid of it is just to, like, like just kill someone while someone watches and then it bypasses you. And I'm like, oh, a white cop in America just has to kill someone and get away with it? Yeah, that's probably, he's fine. He'll be fine. Oh, yeah, he, he's not. Oh, yeah. So, so the way for you not to die if you are, if, if this thing has passed to you uh, is to actually murder someone. You have in to front of someone. In, oh, right. You have to murder someone in front of someone else, so that, that they have this trauma. Yeah, yeah. It it starts to unravel, doesn't it? I think that it was on like in terms of purely a marketing front. I thought, wow, this is this is gonna be one of those movies that you know, I'm gonna get cult status. It's gonna be big, but possibly bigger than that. And I just thought, you know, the idea of someone smiling that's that that is act itself is scary while onto a winner and i felt we felt pretty much exactly the same way you did um and i was we were like really disappointed and then looking into it it was originally going to be a paramount plus original and then they mm -hmm. thought oh we've got something stronger than this we're going to put it out to cinemas so i'm really i'd be really interested to know if the director or the original intent was to have that ending or was it for to open it up for a sequel and this is kind of the awful way they did it basically had they not had that twist at right at the very end so if the movie ended her beating the thing going to see you know the man that she was seeking help and then that's where it ended and he's like okay you can sleep on the couch well whatever all of that stuff right at the end and it all turned out well and that's exactly where the movie ended this would have been a nine out of ten. Or but if the house had burnt down and they ended it slightly earlier, they don't need to go to the flat, just tighten yeah. the I, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah she, right. you know. I, I agree with you. I'm just saying that for, 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 for me it was nice to see her going to going to someone. Nice to see Myself, someone getting better. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because as someone who has sought help for my own mental health issues, I think it's important to see that. And and if you want, like, I see a lot of, I love reading comment sections and a lot of people are like, oh, what? So it's just a happy ending. I don't, one, like, I don't know what horror movies people are watching, but I rarely watch horror movies where there's a happy ending. It always ends badly. And they were saying this was refreshing, that it was like a twist and she dies. I mean, that's typical horror movies since like decades ago. Oh, you thought they escaped and then she didn't. Like, isn't every horror movie end like that? Yeah. Like yeah, that's exactly, not refreshing yeah. to me. So I don't know what horror movies most of these people are watching. But the other thing is, I like someone in Reddit. I can't take uh, credit for this comment, but I don't know the redditor's name. Um, was saying what's realistic if you want realism and to deal with the mental health trauma is that yeah, she defeats it, and then you can see her living her life with her ex, but see the smile demon around her because when it comes to trauma, you can face it and you can work through it, but it's always there. You can't just banish it from your life. You live with this forever. So I would have liked, that's a nice, horrifying ending, but it is realistic to trauma is that you can live with it. You can keep going. It'll still be there. It'll still be a part of your life, but you don't, it don't have, it doesn't have to defeat you. That's the stronger message. And you could easily have a sequel by throwing those little elements of doubt that she's still working through it, even though she's got through what you perceive as the main part of it, the main part of her recovery, could easily throw in elements of doubt for the audience that she's fully recovered or she's still kind of it's a lot exists alongside her and she's kind of you know kept it away easily yeah. do a sequel that way or easily hint at one and to, to do it that way is like okay yeah um and to be honest the happy ending when you're dealing with mental illness or your poor mental health it's not necessarily a happy ending if you've gone through it because you're still going to be recovering in some ways you're still going to have fallout from that well also like what's the happy ending she gifted her nephew a dead cat and then like broke like fell into a thing like had a meltdown in front of her sister and all her friends like (laughs) there's gonna be repercussions she probably would get low or let go from her job because she basically kind of almost went after you know a a, a client like yep. it's really a happy ending even if she's a yeah because her, her whole life she's unraveled have, oh, and well yeah she lost her fiance who turned out to be a jerk so good riddance but i mean it's a of course it's going to be a jerk from uh, from the boots yeah but like um, i don't know i just i just find i know I, I would be curious to know the people that have problems with it and the people who don't, I would, I would, I would be curious to know about the people, the lives of people who are like, hey, yeah, I love that it's a, ha- a like a terrible ending. I'm like, have you had anyone in your life with mental illness, or have you suffered from mental illness? Because I, I do wonder if that's maybe like where that comes from. Because I just don't really understand that. Yeah. Well, good for for those of you who have not experienced mental illness or have people in your life experiences that you actually feel from that people. You know, it's nice. Isn't it nice that you don't have to deal with this stuff? Well, I don't know. I'm just I'm just curious if that if that's where they're coming from because like to me the message was pretty awful and pretty obvious. So I to to want a bad ending in that scenario, I just I have to question like where do you come from in life? Like I want I, I do want to know their background because it'd be interesting to know like what their life story is and to see if if maybe they've just never been touched by mental health issues. Which I mean, you know, that's great, but. Also, I mean, ugh. And on the same back-to-back evenings, uh, Vic and I moved on to a different film, and that film for me is one of my favourites, one of my favourite films of the year. Um, we don't have to go into it fully, but it... I, I'm know. just glad you chose that, because I feel like these two juxtapose against each other. Like, yeah, this, Barbarian. This one, Barbarian is done, trauma done... Right, like the exploration of a horrific real life thing, but done in a good way, I think. It you, is. What was the, the production budget of let me I just brought that up somewhere. Um for Smile was seventeen million dollars. I I I don't I, is it just <laughs> the visual effects? I don't understand where that money went. It went into the last five minutes. <laughs> But then you've got Barbarian, which is nine and a half million dollar budget. Oh uh, yeah! Wow! And, and and how did you get Dustin Long? Like, come on! <laughs> <laughs> that, that was that was one of the smartest marketing uh, ploys they they put out there because it was a Justin Long led trailer originally. 
you know, he's driving the car. It was all positive. And instantly my mind goes to Jeepers Creepers. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be another twisted Justin Long horror film. And then you've got, you know, Bill Skarsgård and what's his price going to be? Because his cachet is massive, right, in horror. Um, mm-hmm. After Pennywise and all of that and, you know, the other stuff he's done. So his his stock's massive. His family name's massive. So, you know, um, I was really it, shocked. Stop this thing on an iPhone. Come on. Is it is it spoilers? To, I don't know how many of spoilers of it, but like I love the way this movie played with the casting in a way because everybody knows Justin Long as like nice guy. He's Mister Mac. Like oh, he's oh, so lovely. Yeah. Bill Skarsgård is like like uh, is it Bill? No, sir. What's his name? Um, <laughs> I think it's Bill. Let me check. Anyway. Yeah, he's Pennywise. Anyways, he's Pennywise. So he's like, and he has kind of a sinister look about him, even without the evil clown makeup. Yeah. Um. I so I really enjoyed how they played with the casting in that and your expectations. Yeah. I don't know if we're being spoiler free. Yeah. So um, like, no, I, I think I think we can dip into the spoilers because it's been out long enough now. I just yeah. think this movie uh, is is what Smile should have been, right? Now, obviously, it deals. Uh, it deals with the trauma and mental illness, but also deals with misogyny on a much higher level. Like, it's much more... Yeah, this is it. definitely, I wouldn't say this is a mental illness thing. This is it's definitely, just, like, uh, it's, 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 it's female. It's, it's, it's definitely about the patriarchy and then with an under a big undercurrent, a very big undercurrent of race. Um, yeah. So it's yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. like where, where, where Smile is, there's, like, it's, it's mostly mental illness and all that stuff uh, with a slight undertone of... of, of dealing with misogyny i feel this this the other way around it's all about the patriarchy and and just and, and misogyny and then there's <laughs> a bit of the, the trauma the, it, the... it kind of it in terms of how i felt about this film and how much i enjoyed it and how i liked the t- really twisted put uh, uh different plot points it reminded me of how much i enjoyed don't uh, don't breathe um uh, because there's a oh. really have you, have you both seen that yeah, yeah, yeah when you've you know with the whole thing in the basement and you've yeah. got the 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 situation where he's trying to baste someone you know it's like it reminds me so much of kind of a series of violations and it's just absolutely horrific because there's a there's a serial killer in not serial killer but basically a serial killer called uh, Joseph Fritzl from Austria who kept his daughter in the basement and his wife knew yeah. about it. And then he fathered children through her. Uh, and then it was a series of like, you know, it was a horrific, horrific thing uh, in the news. And it just went, my mind went straight there. Um, but I, I look, I, I kind of knew straight away in my head, as soon as I saw Bill, Bill Skarsgård, I knew it wasn't going to go down the route of him being evil. Yeah, it's kind of obvious. It was like an easy kind of like, well, let's let's just change this. I I I loved um about one I read about this the writer his idea for the Bill Skarsgård scene was he once read a book about red flags in first dates or something, and he's like, yeah. how many red flags can I fit into this <laughs> situation in one scene? So that's how he wrote that scene. But I kind of love how um in terms of casting and stuff, it's that like each male we encounter in this um, film, save for the poor homeless man, um, um, is like a um, a certain level of misogyny and it goes down. So the first guy built, like the first guy she encounters is actually quite nice, but she he doesn't listen to her. Like he says, she's like, this is bad. We got to get out of here right now. And he's like, like, he doesn't believe her that this is really bad. We need to leave. And yeah. because of that, things go badly. And then you have the Justin Long character who's, you know, a obvious slime ball, but then he's confronted with a real life horrific guy. And he's like, he doesn't see himself in that either. When he meets him, he's like, what's wrong with you? Not recognizing that he is just also a terrible person. Like, yeah. I just, you know what I mean? It's like different levels of misogyny in each of these characters, which I thought was really interesting. I did, lo- I did quite enjoy how it, you thought he was gonna kind of reverse the type of guy he was when he was confronted with the situation, and yeah. it it slowly kind of builds up to the fact no, he's just gonna be an asshole the entire way through. 
And I, I, well, I and there's certain oh, things. Like... Oh, I was going to say what's interesting is that Justin Long character, Justin Long's character sees the horror and the evil of the, the of of the I guess the patriarch, yet somehow doesn't see the problem in himself. So yeah. he, he does for a second yeah. before he eats yeah. her off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's that's so typical of of that. Where yeah, yeah, you you you'll, you'll self reflect even for a second. Go, eh, you know yeah, I'm but not. then it's inconvenient for you to actually be the better person, so you yeah. just totally distract immediately. Yeah. Sorry, you were saying, Alan? No, I just love. I was going to kind of switch it up, and um, my question. I loved. I loved her character. I thought she was. I thought she was excellent, and then the. There was there, there's such a the biggest suspension of disbelief wasn't that she stayed there wasn't that she left I thought you can just leave now go go somewhere else I'm sure just sleep in your car that was my that was our idea go and sleep in your car in the city you know if the police stop you just move on that was the that was where my head went but then as soon as you were standing at the top of those stairs or even the first door that opens in the basement you go nah I'm not going in there. And, yeah. and it wasn't it wasn't that she was a brave character, it was just that it's really fucking stupid to do that. Yeah. Then as soon as you see that other door and that other as soon as you see if you, as soon as you see a carved entrance into earth, <laughs> you should know something's up, right? I I um I like someone's interpretation and I don't know if this is actually where the um the writers were going, but the fact that I think she mentioned something about a bad breakup when she's stalking in their first little date and um, about losing herself in a guy. And someone was saying, like, this woman's, like, she keeps putting men above her own safety against her better judgment and going yeah. into dangerous situations for their sake. And they felt like when she confronts the like quotations monster at the end and she's crying about that it's like her letting go of that part of herself like i'm yeah. done being or putting men ahead of myself that's and interesting that yeah like, uh, like her moment of uh recognition of that because like looking in the face of what these men have wrought and what they've created and put into this world she's not going to do that anymore which I don't know if that was the original ten, but I like that interpretation. That is that is really interesting. Yeah. Um. My um. My particular favorite moment of this film is when he's measuring the house. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You know when. I, he, we... Oh, you know, that... day for change. He's unhappy. That's okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, my favorite moment of the film is when he's measuring the house. With a oh. tape measure. Oh my god! And then it's it's one of the funniest things because it there's a there's a Casey Neistat um, video on YouTube where he's on this um, fly Emirates plane to go to I think it's Dubai or something like that, and he's using a tape measure to measure the cabin because it's massive, and there's a bathroom yeah. and all sorts, and it's like that in terms of the way it's edited together. And then as soon as he opens the first door, he's got no doubt about measuring it, and then as soon as you see that old what. VHS camera or Betamax camera. I'm like, you gotta question that. Dude, he messes so the room. Yeah, he doesn't even notice the dog cage is like, but that was I love this. There's so many layers in this film because that's what he was saying in that conversation they have with over their like wine date. Is like you men just barrel into every situation. You don't yeah. have to or never like you have to be cautious. We do. We have to second guess every single thing we do. Exactly. Because there's danger around every corner for us. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not just... Sorry. Thanks for right. change. Okay. I don't I don't think they're actual I think they are dog cages, but I think they actually kept his depending on how the generational thing works and who the the mother person really is, if it's like a third daughter of a daughter kind of thing. Is if he kept the earlier generations of children in those yeah. cages? I, I like. I thought the interesting thing about that too was that they portray her like one of the other things I noticed they were good about is they portrayed her as like monstrous, but she wouldn't go near that old man's room. 
yeah, yeah. she's scared of the old man and she could rip him in half yeah. at any point she could she could get away from him but she she's too afraid of him uh yeah i love that scene when she was backing down da- backing down or backing backing up from that from the doorway i love that because it also was really scary it, it is really scary terrifying. yeah <laughs> yeah in the, in the tunnel uh, uh, I was. Th- I, have you seen some of the marketing that the T-shirt with um the bottle of milk with hair on it? Uh, oh no! I <laughs> I was so gross. Yeah, I have to be really careful. You know, with horror T-shirts, especially, can I wear this at work? That's that's usually my my judgment whether I buy something. I wouldn't or be able to wear that anywhere, <laughs> except a horror festival. Yeah, and even yeah. then. Not everyone would know what that is. No, you go dressed as a bottle of milk, like a big bottle of milk with arms sticking out with hair on top. That's that's the move. I mean, I've seen the big bottle of milk costume. There you go. There's your horror. I, hair do I. <laughs> I think I've just scared my son to the point where he's like, you know what, Baba? No. Baba, no. No, no, no. No big bottle of milk with hair on it. No. Um, but no, I, I got a lot of enjoyment from that film. I, I thought, yeah, I, I really, really dug it. And I love the casting of what's the actor called? Um, the father figure. He's in, he's in, um, he's he killed Batman's parents in Batman Begins. Joe Chill, what his character was, I think. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going on Google looking it up. I, I'm curious how much do you know about like. How does this play outside of like North America? Richard. A lot of this movie kind of relied on this, like, like knowing about white flight in the 1950s and stuff. Did you oh, kind I of see? Yeah, them? well, I, I wasn't, no, normally kind of I'd lose kind of track of that, but I kind of, I think because of watching enough American cinema, um, yeah. and j- just Richard Brake is the actor, Richard Brake. Um, but yeah, I kind of understood that enough and. I loved how vibrant, how kind of almost like eerie Indiana that street was. You know, was it the fifties or sixties? It was. Um, but I loved that. Yeah. This that film was so incredibly. It's just so incredibly, uh, incredibly made. Layers, yeah. lots of layers. Like. Yeah, and it makes you think. It actually makes you think. And then sticks the landing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, it was, yeah, it was really tragic in the end, and I don't know. I really like the ending of the film. Really and if anyone it. wants to have a sequel for this thing, which I hope never happens, I mean, for all we know, that the "quote unquote" monster could have survived, or there could be another one. Oh, do you remember that line they said? There's like uh, the homeless man said, "They're they're they're monsters, plural." In in the... no, she he said that she's not the worst thing. Oh, sorry, there. yeah, but she's not the worst. Message to say. He was, she, I thought he was talking about the man that was down there. Because he's Sorry, definitely yes. the worst thing down there. That's yeah. right, yeah. That was the line. There are worse things down there. She's not even the worst thing she, down yeah. there. Yeah, and you, you as an audience member, mm-hmm. immediately assume there are tons of other monsters down there. When in reality, all he's really talking about, we think, is the That's old man. Disgusting. Yeah. I love um, there's the cinematography. There's some sim- really simple things like... Um, when Justin Long's in the cage with the the main the the main kind of female lead, and he's not drinking the milk, and it's yeah. they use they use a very wide angle lens for when the milk is being like pushed in his face and he's not not taking a drink, and it, mm-hmm. I just love little little, little flourishes of um, kind of just kind of detail like that, and it is grim, it's absolutely grim. Yeah. I'd have been I'd have been on that bottle straight away. <laughs> well, I would have done anything they they asked me to do to stay alive. I, I one of the things that'll stick me in this movie is like the horror and tragedy of her like booping the woman's nose and saying oh my God, Baba. Yeah. Baba. Yeah. It was just so like scary and creepy, but also just so tragic. Like the whole thing. It was so well done. Like Yeah, I honestly You know you know what's you know a good you know it's a good sign of a. Uh, I think quite an entertaining and like when you're really into a horror film, especially is what would I do in this situation? 
Yes. I think yeah. there's a, you know if you if you can get that if you can get an audience to start thinking like that, I think you're gonna have a successful film. Um, yeah. but I really loved it. I loved it. What I would have done is if I saw the room the 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 video equipment in it, I would have been like, damn, this is a good place to rent out for uh, to Hollywood. <laughs> Make some money. Make some money oh, off, of, yeah. uh, off of renting that room out. It's so creepy. Ooh. They can make Saw 16 in that. Just, yeah. just, does underground square footage count in the... Okay, not usually, but... <laughs> no, yeah, right. I'm sorry. That section of the film was oh, so good. brilliant. It's so it was brilliant, brilliant, yeah. But also the messaging. And at one point, nine it, and a like, half out of ten, man. I love that. Oh. Luke pointed out he grabbed the laptop and like tried one password and then just tossed it on the bed. He's like, "That's too much effort." For yeah, me. that <laughs> was like, brilliant. Was, was it? Well, yeah, he threw it onto the bedside cover, didn't he? Yeah, <laughs> and it landed. It landed perfectly. Break it in, and then just yeah. gave up immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is hilarious and yeah, so so typical. He's so I I don't know. This is the second time we've seen him in a horror movie. Playing a, 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 a yeah, he's a, he's good. He's really is the other is the other one that um, Kevin Vampire. Smith thing? The Tusk. I forgot what it's called. It's the Vampire one. Yeah, that one wasn't very good. I, I already remember. forgot. It's the Vampire one. I was <laughs> talk about it, but then, again, I got kidnapped by doppelganger, so it kind of yeah. lost time. Uh, 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 yeah. I loved, I think, setting up the desperation he had going on in his head because obviously, you know, he was of what the shitty situ- shitty kind of person he is. And then it goes to his accountant or business manager or um, whoever the character is and says, you've got like two months. For this spending rate, you've got two months left of your money. And uh, yeah. setting up his desperation is fantastic. And, it was. Yeah. They also, I loved how they slowly peeled back his his image like at the beginning you could kind of maybe like oh maybe it was a misunderstanding i mean i i didn't think that obviously <laughs> I was yeah. just like, oh. but they just they didn't really definitively tell you anything and then you get to that bar scene where he's like you know she said no but you know i was i'm persistent and you're like yeah, ah yeah. i'm starting to see you know like yeah. he, that's how they kind of slowly revealed his grossness um but no, yeah, they kind of that that was the moment, wasn't it, where if you had any doubt that he wasn't a gross individual, but yeah. yeah, you are, he is awful. And then it's like, do I want this the awful evil things to happen to him? Yeah, po- probably. probably. And, then, and then there's elements where you go back and forth, the the way the direction his character goes in. You think, is he gonna be a hero of the piece? You know what I mean? So um yeah, I loved all that kind of back and forth and that montage scene, especially measuring up, things up, was absolutely brilliant. Can I can I voice my one pet peeve with this movie, which is a pet peeve for all horror movies? Horror movies, I feel like, have indoctrinated us into never helping people. You know, you get these movie stories where they're like, she sat on the side of the road for two hours and no one stopped to help. But I'm like, this is poor movies. Like, poor homeless man. Every horror movie, they're like, if you stop and help someone, someone's going to pop out of nowhere and, like, beat you to death. Like, they train us to be like, well, I don't want to stop. No, I'm going to get killed if I stop and help Yeah, someone. It is so true. Every single horror movie, and not just horror, even thrillers now, I, I if, if there's a good Samaritan. Oh, yeah, you're right. If there's a good Samaritan, I'm like, they're going to die. And they die horror. <laughs> yeah, the worst, most undeserved death. I, I feel like there's like a campaign in horror movies to try and convince us to never stop and help our fellow man in danger. Because they're always yeah. like, "Oh, you're gonna get murdered by like someone, some serial killer if you do." Yeah, uh, I, 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 it's not, it's not a good thing, obviously, for the what, how the police acted in this because it was horrific, like yeah. doubting her straight away. At, is it the gas station or a petrol station here? Yeah, uh, I was thinking she was a drug addict. That's yeah. crazy. Yup. Um, but as soon as you, you know, if someone's dirty and you just assume that she's a drug addict. There's, you know, police should be trained enough that they have their own teeth. They're, you know, they're eloquent in terms of how they speak. They're not slurring their words. So really shitty police they've got there in this film, you know? But she's a black woman on the street. Yeah. So of course, they're going to ignore her like are that. Both the, are both the officers... Right, was, what, what, she's a drug addict. 
Like yeah. they're, those are those are the ones that are most likely to be targeted by someone like that. They are the most vulnerable. So um, you're about to mention the ethnicities of the police officers. Yeah, where, where there was one black and one white. Yeah, but that's actually a very good commentary on the fact that once you become a police part of the police, you're kind of part of that crew. Yeah, culture, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. You're still part of it. Like. I'm not going to name names and talk about ethnicities, but I I know, or sorry, have an acquaintance who is who is a, a police officer, and the person they were and the, that I met ages yeah. ago and the person they have become, it are com- two completely different people. Wow. Like I'm not saying this person didn't have. Clearly, they had the potential to become what they've become. But yeah. as a police officer, they are a gun nut. And they're Canadian. They are an absolute gun nut to the point where they have their child wearing uh, clothing that uh, just talks about gun rights being human rights. Wow. They're indoctrinating their own child into, into this whole gun loving culture. So. Yeah. I'm not. I'm just saying there is a problem with police. That, that's a that's a really good way to explain it. To yeah. So even and this, I, I'm just I'm just gonna say this person I'm talking about is not white. So that it's like um, uh, it's so, also the blue wall of silence or whatever. It, yeah. It's a very well known, at least in the states. I'm sure it's the same in Canada. Like if you dare speak out against a fellow officer for um, misbehavior, you're gonna get like in. Oh yeah, you're in so, trouble. Look, I don't. I don't believe in getting rid of the police. I just believe in reforming the way they function uh, and then using the money that normally is given to them, especially to buy, like, essentially militarize them, which is ludicrous. Oh, my God, yeah. On on social services and also on training personnel that maybe are not police officers, but at least trained to handle high-stress, dangerous situations as counselors or whatever. So that we have multiple, uh, uh, what's the word I'm trying to, uh, avenues of, 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 of de-escalation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's um, really fascinating actually, because the police in the U S especially, um, this could have easily happened in what the sixties and seventies in terms of how much kind of military, op- op- you know, hardware they had, but instead of bringing stuff back from the Vietnam war, they pushed it off boats. They got rid of the helicopters anything they had they kind of disposed of so uh-huh. a lot of that stuff that came back you know, even the even the weapons the armored vehicles that some certain police departments have isn't just surplus that's made in the US it's brought back because it's actually cost effective you can just bring it back but in the 1670s they just dumped it off the side of aircraft carriers oh. so it's really fascinating to see where that yeah. goes and that attitude situation is that yeah. blue wall you talk about, Jess, is uh, makes complete sense in this, especially. Yeah, uh, but it's really good. is it set in Detroit? This as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is. yeah. So it it, is. that was like it, they were a big victim of like the white flight, is what they call it. Like, um, yeah. you know, all the white people left and just basically abandoned the city. And yeah, because I know about you know the stuff with the water supply and like you're saying about the earlier scene, the flashback stuff being super bright and. Stepford Wives kind of thing. It's um, it's really that that's one of the most interesting moments for me is when you see those scenes and he's just going back to his house and the neighbor's about to sell up, um, and then he's the street is. I love I love how you don't see the street at night at the beginning, and then you oh, really yeah, see really... it later. Yeah, and I also like that. I mean, that's why I was wondering. I was curious to what you thought of that. Was like, you know, with any time with these movies where you have like a silent a killer that's not caught, you think, well, how did he get away with it this long? But it was brilliant for me, yeah. I guess, for American audiences to be like, yeah, it's Detroit. Like he could do whatever he wants. No one's gonna exactly. Like, you know, I, yeah, because, because those communities or certain communities were so abandoned um, by by social services and police, like you know or, or and and he's preying on probably like very vulnerable people that, that society yeah. has just deemed unworthy of help right so, yeah that feeds into that feeds into the um the police not wanting to go there as well yeah um, yeah and obviously i mean the poor homeless man. Yeah, obviously that's... he's a good guy and and but you know he's no he's futile he's like i'll just stay clear like and try and where he tried to warn her um, not to go in there like he's a good guy 
I'm so I'm sure he tried to do something at some point, but you know, what can yeah. you do? Yep. Um, but yeah, this is just a brilliant film because we're 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 getting a little long in the episode, so we have to bring it to a close. I was saying earlier, I give this movie a nine point five out of ten. It is one of the best horror films I've ever seen, and definitely the best this year. Yeah, totally agree. Absolutely agree. What do you think, Jess? For your yeah, final, co- final, final comment. comment. This was such a good two films to put together because it's just. How do you address real life horrors in a responsible manner in a way that makes you think um, like this is how you do it? Um, smile is definitely not. Yeah. You do not. You do not use uh, a real life um, trauma and, and that people suffer from just to push your own little like oh like scary twist ending like that's not responsible filmmaking as far as I'm concerned. Um, whereas I feel like this barbarian was definitely the opposite. It was really good, really made you think. Like I haven't thought about. I thought this deep, like since watching like maybe like Get Out, like Jordan Peele's movie. I feel oh, like. Oh, Get Out is. You know what I mean? Like like equivalent. I feel like a a, a thoughtful like. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Get Out is definitely a, a makes you yeah, think. Yeah, that's. I feel like this is kind of the first one that's kind of gotten that close to like a Get Out feeling, um, in a while. So. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. This has been great. It's been really great. All right, everybody. So thank you for uh, being present for my return from being kidnapped by doppelgangers. Also, thank you very much for being here to to uh, celebrate the coming up to the show of my wife. Uh, <laughs> she is awesome. And uh, thank you guys for adding great ambient background noise for a movie with creepy uh, breastfeeding video. Yes, and uh, and the couple's uh, uh, fractious little uh, argument that was fantastic as well. That was totally <laughs> not not faked. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, so everybody, thank you again. And if you uh, like what you're listening to, you uh, please consider following us on Instagram. We are on social media as at the Outbound Podcast. Uh, we would love to feature your artwork or any of your horror-related things. So if you'd like to be featured on our Instagram, please send us a private message over there, and, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll give you a mention. Uh, also, every subscription, every follow helps. And if you can, and if you feel so inclined, please give us a very positive 10 out of 10, five stars out of five stars review on your podcast platform. That will get us up there as well to get more listeners and allow us to do a lot more with our podcast. Uh, Again, our social media is at The Hellbound Podcast, Harness the Darkness.